It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. What's up? What's happening? Welcome in to the Take Command podcast. That is Logan Paulson. I am Craig Hoffman. And uh, we got a game to talk about. Uh, This week, Logan, we're going to talk about the game against the Dolphins, obviously, and then we will do a roster projection later in the week. And so uh, we tell you that not just so you can get really excited about the roster projection later in the week, uh, if you're listening or watching right now, but so that you know, we will talk about a lot more players. There, there's so much from this game against Miami, Logan, and that we can't possibly get to it all in one podcast. But when we go position group by position group and make uh, quote unquote cuts, uh, fake cuts, ones that don't matter, <laughs> Uh, ones that can be overcome because there are more time to be played and also because we are not Adam Peters, uh, that that we will get to the rest of the players later in the week. But how's Miami? It was fun, man. <clears throat> you know, it's kind of a whirlwind when you get down there because you're just running around and you're at the game for like five hours at the stadium because you got to be there before the players and all this stuff. So it's a good time, though. You know, good good to hang out with like Fletch and Bram and, uh, you know, Chick and B. Mitch. Those guys are always a fun time to to be hanging around with and uh yeah it's always it's good but it's 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 a lot and so it's good to be back home yeah for sure uh is the formula one track still around that stadium or do they like somehow <laughs> it is, take, yeah okay it is I like, I, they, like I, somehow take it up but it's a it's it's road so i would imagine it's got to stay down yeah we were walking out and you know it's whatever it's 11 30 you're leaving the game and all of a sudden you're like you're looking down you're like why does the road look like this and fletch is like oh this is where the indy car is and i was like oh that's kind of cool so they they leave the the don't get it twisted don't insult formula one like that i'll do it yeah formula one good stuff f1 yeah no indy car i don't believe indy car goes through miami indy car they they just yeah indy car they just go in circles uh formula one formula one's more they uh, turn more dynamic yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> gotta gotta get on Drive to Survive, bro. You'd love that show. Anyway, I've watched it. I like. I, I really enjoy it. I just don't. I'm not into it the same way you're into it. So yeah, I'm excited. But I do F1's like it. Back this weekend. Oh well, good to know for all those F1 fans that yeah. watch this show. Yeah. Uh, however, that's that's not what this podcast is about. It's about. <laughs> football all right uh let's start off with Jaden daniels because that's that's what the people are here for um another just seemingly la di da i'm Jaden daniels i'm good at football kind of day um obviously there's there's a couple of more more uh key things to talk about uh the big controversy of the day is hey Jaden, could you get down uh that's a quote from dan quinn uh it's but what what do you make of the day overall then we can get into to some of the details yeah, I think there's a lot going on with his, what was it, 18 plays or so. And I think yeah. uh, a couple things that stick out to me just in terms of watching is there is a, it is, it does seem like it's a very straightforward version of the offense. You know, they're not asking him to make a lot of like uber challenging throws. And I think that's, you know, like you could make an argument that's a good thing, right? That they're trying to keep it simple for him. And he's making it simple because he's able to identify the coverages and kind of pre-snap where the ball should go. And, uh, you know, I think we talked about before the show started, there's a lot of kind of that RPO pre-snap, you know, we're counting people. Are we short here? If we're getting pressure, the ball goes out to the screen type stuff. Um, and so I, I really feel like it's it's kind of a pretty stark contrast to what EB was doing last year with Sam Howell, where it's like, He's deleveraged. We're finding simple opportunities and we're going to kind of stay ahead of the sticks. I also thought they did a great job on that a couple second and longs, which, which I thought they handled really well. Cliff did in terms of understanding, you know, I have two plays to get 10, which was really, I think, good forward thinking and obviously great execution by, uh, by Daniels. And then I thought there was a couple plays where yeah, I think he's going to, like, I think overall he had a very solid performance. But there was a couple plays where I thought the, the defense kind of tricked him. There was that, <clears throat> it was, uh, I think, it was a third down and they brought like a, it was a fire zone pressure. And so like, again, credit to Miami, this is pretty challenging, but they overloaded the right side, offensive line slid left. They kind of dropped into a cover two structure. So with the cover two structure, he probably even should have been working the right side. The right concept is more of a zone beating concept in my estimation, but he kind of it looked like press man coverage to the side where Terry was. And so he tried to throw him like a fade, but it's really cover two. So, you know, like the throw almost gets home, but I think like he just didn't see it. And again, like that's what's going to happen as defenses get more complicated. But I think overall, pretty solid performance. And, um, you know, I, I think, again, there's there's some concerns I have about 
you know, like what is what happens when the throws become a little bit more challenging when we're asked to do more in the offense. But maybe this is the philosophy with him. And I don't think this is a bad approach. Like you want to make sure he feels really comfortable. He looks very comfortable. And you can win a lot of football games playing good defense, playing this version of an offense and uh, make sure your quarterback of the future is comfortable and confident. Yeah. So that was going to be one of my main questions is like, is what we're seeing, like what from this game slash this preseason slash this camp is translatable to the regular season and what is kind of too simple. And I do think that with a simple offense from everything I've learned in covering this league for a decade at this point is you can run simple if you execute it ruthlessly well, but like it, that part of that is your quarterback has to be really on it from quick decision-making because you know, defenses can adapt faster to simple stuff. They figure it out quickly. It's like, Oh, this is this we're here. But if the quarterback knows that and can get ahead of that, there is a small, small sliver window of time that you can, you can beat even, you know, or with a simple offense, good defense. And to me, Jaden Daniels seems capable of doing that so far. We'll see once you get into the regular season and we're, we're facing true one defenses because he's also doing it so far against not a one defense. I guess in practice he is, uh, you know, against the commander's defense and they're executing pretty well in practice. Um, But I I think that that's going to be the thing is, is his quick processing ability, his quick release, his accuracy, his understanding of, I got to put the ball, not just to this receiver, but here to this receiver on this shoulder and his ability to execute that kind of stuff. Is that enough to overcome the simplicity And you add in the fact that defenses are going to have to simplify a little bit too because of his running threat. And is that enough to, you know, with good play calling and and et cetera, to create a successful offense? And I think the other thing we have to mention with Cliff's history is, is it enough to create a successful offense all the way through January versus it works until November and then things go sideways because defenses figure a few things out. So I, I think that's the key question at this point going into the year um, with with this offense, with Jaden, and and all the, all the success we've seen so far, and whether or not it can translate. Yeah, and I also think like a big point of emphasis for them, <clears throat> at least you know, like in terms of what Dan was saying in press conferences and stuff, was that they wanted to operate with a exceptional tempo. And so one of the things that you get when you run tempoed offenses is usually it becomes more simplistic. And so there's there's good there's pros and cons to that. Like you know, obviously as it, it's simple because. And, that works because the defense has to kind of be simpler, right? They can't run all the blitzes because they can't get the the calls in as quickly, right? And so once you kind of have a feel for what their response is going to be to certain formations, you can operate quickly and move fast. And I think think that's something that I, I would expect to change a little bit in season. I would expect them to kind of keep the tempo and probably I would assume run more tempo than the league average, you know, even if it's, you know, 5% 5% more or whatever, I would expect them to be a little bit more uh, demonstrative with that that feature of an offense. But also, like, when you think about over the course of a season or even over the course of the game, like, the ability to go tempo and then go huddle up, go tempo, go huddle up, is really, really effective. And so I do think you'll see, especially after watching practice, I think you'll see kind of a mixture of both where you'll get the complexity from the huddle. Because, like, again, if you're huddling, you can have more verbiage, you can have more motions, you can have more complexity to the call. And, you know, you've been out to practice. We've seen some of that stuff. And I think this might have just been in the game. Let's run our basic offense let's run it fast let's let the quarterback kind of get back there and deal because you know quite frankly like Peyton Manning's offense that he ran when he was in Indianapolis is not is not too far from what we saw yesterday and so what I mean by that is he would get kind of in a very declarative formation you know like let's say it's three by one you put your best receiver to the left you have three receivers to the right it's hard to disguise coverage to that so as the quarterback, I can say, oh, I and Peyton would check to the play that he wanted. But in the context of this offense, like basically Jaden's identifying matchups. He's saying, do I like the matchup with the X? If yes, I'm just going to throw a hitch to him. And I think that that's, that's a good way to run an offense. You know what I'm saying? If Terry's the guy that's running a hitch. And again, like, you know, you can argue about where he ranks in terms of the pantheon of the best receivers in the NFL, but he can consistently win one-on-ones. You know, and I think that's what you're looking at, right? And they did the same thing with Diami. They kind of line him up. He's isolated. You like the matchup, throw the hitch. And if they press, they're going to run a go. And if you like the go, throw the go. And I think, like, that's 
good because again it's just identifying matchups where the ball should go and so in terms of simplicity yeah it was simple but i do think i think when you're in a preseason game i think the point of emphasis can change and i think it just based on the conversations that i heard from press conferences and, and things like that it sounded like the point of emphasis was like let's go quick and this is a result the offense is going to look a little bit more simple but there is a benefit to the simplicity and i think in season you'll see probably again like i said a combination or a mixture of the two yeah, um, I, I think that the other part of going quickly, John talked about this, kind did on, on his pod post game, is like if you're going to do this, you have to have a quarterback who can handle that decision making. And sure. I think that Jaden, like I'm trying to think of the right analogy here. The best, the best I can do right now, uh, based off my recent life experience, is when you learn a language, right? So when I was trying to learn French for when I was going to France. I could never get my brain to think in French. Like everything was a translation for me. But I've now flipped my Duolingo back to Spanish. And because I learned Spanish in high school, like I can get my brain to think in Spanish a little bit. Like I can, I can function at just a higher level. It's more fundamental to, to me in doing it. I think Jaden understands this offense at a fundamental level that each decision is far less stressful. Like he sees a big picture and is able to react versus... I, if I see X, then I do Y. Like, it's not this like painful process for him to do it. And so because he so fundamentally understands this, he's able to make quick, uh, correct decisions, snap in, snap out, snap in, snap out at tempo. And I think that's like, that's how this works. And it's not going to work every week. There are limitations, but as you said, there are advantages as well. And I, I think that's the thing to watch is, can he consistently do that? Can he consistently just understand, okay, oh, this is the coverage, then this is dead, I must do this. And it kind of is the Brian Dable, what do I do on this play? I throw a touchdown. Or what do you do against this coverage? Throw a touchdown. I just think he understands it at such a fundamental level. And then the the goal would be over the very long term to, to build on that and add layers of complexity um, that he understands just as well. And again, it's not simple because he can't understand more complex. It's simple because you don't need to be any more complex, at least at the start. Yeah, and I do think like when you're t teaching and coaching a quarterback, it really depends like to your point, like what is his like what is his ability, like what is his processing rate? What is his processing ability? And I don't think you ever really want to exceed that. And I think what you're seeing here, especially in the preseason, again, and I think it'll get more complicated as we go, is like a really good understanding of Cliff of that specific concept, right? Don't give him too much because like, for example, like you can run five plays and I think Miami's a really good example of this they don't they didn't run a lot of plays yesterday they ran it looked like they ran a lot of plays because they have motions and shifts and mo and fake reverses and all this kind of stuff but they're running like the same kind of core concepts every single time and so that's their way to hide or make their offense look more complex but when you do it that way it makes it super simple for the quarterback to be like I don't need to worry about all of this variation in the offense all I need to know is that we're running drift or a running spacing or a running whatever. It just got this crazy motion off of it, but the read is the same. And I think what Cliff is doing is kind of saying, hey, we're going to line up in a nice flat picture. You're going to pick your best stuff and you're going to help us get in the right play. Because I, I think another element to this is when you're going hurry up, you can also signal because again, you can identify coverage a little bit better. So I didn't see him do a lot of that yesterday like he did in the Jets game, but I we have seen him do that a lot in practice. you know. And I do think that that's something that will be another additional feature of this offense is saying you like this matchup you like this concept let's get to it versus these coverage structures so I, I do think that like we're talking about the complexity here we're talking about him understanding I think he's shown a tremendous understanding in practice I think Cliff has done a really good job and Tavita and the whole offensive staff of kind of slowly bringing him along but he's shown that he can handle it because he's willing to put in that extra time but ultimately like this is a preseason game and I and I think this is not I don't think this is the final version or the final maturation of what this offense is going to look like because of the things you just said. I think the quarterback's smart enough to handle more stuff. And I think they they understand, I think Cliff understands watching the 2021 Arizona tape that the offense needs to kind of layer up as we go in order to kind of match and kind of, again, just it's the same offense. It's the same principles. You just put a little bit of window dressing on it so the defense can't key on it the same way. 
Yeah, for sure. And I think that Cliff probably fundamentally, I would hope at this point, understands that he needs to leave something in the bag for later in the year because that's been, you know, one of the problems for him at, at Texas Tech at, at Arizona, where defenses kind of catch on to him later in the in the season. And and obviously I I have a lot of faith in Cliff actually to to kind of overcome that this year um, because he's just focused on the offense late in the season uh, where he's never been an OC at the NFL level um, and I and I also think Cliff's really really smart and he's he's learned some lessons and hopefully we'll see him apply that um, I think the other part of this though that kind of gets to the last thing I, I would like to talk about offensively before we highlight maybe a couple of players and then get to the defensive side of the ball is the like I'll, I'll call it an all RPO offense, but it's not, um, it's, you know, there, there is the ability just to kind of get in the right play all the time. And sometimes it is true RPO where the ball is snapped. You're reading a linebacker and it's like, and we saw one of those, um, I think it was the, the completion of Bates, I think was the receiver on that one, um, where he, he pulls it and, and finds a tight end up the seam because the linebacker gets out of the throwing window. Other times he's handing it off, but sometimes, as you mentioned, I think earlier, I, th I think this was in the show, not when we were talking beforehand, but it's a box count situation. Like, oh, we're light over there so we can throw the screen and we got good numbers. But but I, I think kind of the point is the, uh, the these concepts, they might be a small number, but they all play off each other. And they right. drag the defense all over the field. And that's exhausting as a defense to feel like you're never right and you're always chasing the game. It's exhausting as a defense to have to literally run sideline to sideline. And then after all this horizontal stuff, these outside runs, these screens, the, these quick hitters where you're trying to rally to the football, you know Cliff is looking for the opportunity to get vertical on you. So you start to cheat up a little bit and bang, they hit you over the top. And so I, I think that even if you have a small number of concepts, if they play off of each other well, you don't need a lot. You just need to get the defense to do the thing that you that they don't want to do, uh, they don't want to do, and you want them to do. And then you hit them for a big play, and that's how you score in the NFL. Yeah, and I th uh, so I, uh, let's talk about this. So I don't think the Bates play is a true RPO. I think that's like a pop pass because, and the only reason I think that is because everybody else is running routes. You know, like Terry's mm -hmm. running a dig, and usually with a pop pass or with a RPO. Like because there is a limitation how deep the offensive line can get down the field, it's a quick hitting play. So I think like slants, quick seams, stuff like that. So you got Terry on a dig. Obviously, you're not throwing that off an RPO, right? You're throwing right. that off of a play action. But I do think to your point, like what they did a good job of in this game, and something I want to talk about was, um, you know, they started running this single back power counter, however you want to characterize it, with the guards kicking out the wide nine, you know, like in these kind of sub looks uh, with Miami's defense. And B Rob's gashing them for like, you know, probably eight yards a pop, right? Yeah. Um, he, had and two, then I, he had three carries, two of them went for 11 yards. Right. And so great 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 understanding of how to get to your run game with something that's more efficient because they came out early they wanted to run this counter play they were getting all this pressure on first down they got into this sub look they got less pressure so let's run the football out of this and, and get some runs we really like so i love that they did that and then, then to your point i love how they married that with the pop pass because you need to run single back power usually in order to kind of set up the pop pass they do that Great job by Jade making that throw. But the other stuff you were talking about, the box count stuff, like they ran what, what looked to be like a bounce to the right, you know, where they're pulling the guard in the center to the right. Jaden's reading the offside nickel, right? The nickel blitzes, you're short, right? Throw the bubble, right? And that ends up being a four-yard gain. So everyone's like, oh, that's kind of a nothing play. But it's second and six, right? And now we're right. we're it's like it's basically like if I just would have handed it off. But instead of handing it off into a bad look, now I get the ball out, right? So I think that's a really good example. There was another one where they're running outside zone or outside or tight zone from the gun to the right. It's three over three. You get blocks by the receivers. Ball goes out. So again, those aren't true like RPOs, but it's ways, it's tools in an offense to maximize run looks. And that's something that I've been very critical of of the last couple offenses that have been here is like you're running into bad looks. And like Kyle is like, we're not running into bad looks. And Kyle and Sean and, you know, Mike, they get to that differently because it's like we're going to have two runs called. We're going to check to the one we like better versus this look. And if we don't like either one, we're going to check to a pass. Instead of doing that, this is a little bit more straightforward, right? It's like, do we like the number count over here? Are we getting a pressure? Let's get the ball out to those guys. And so as the season progresses, like – um Philadelphia did this a lot, you know, so I'm sure Brian Johnson's had some influence on this, but as the season progresses, like those guys will press, right? And so then that, that, that safety valve is no longer there. But if you're going to press, I'm going to check to a go. 
And if I check to a go, you've got Terry, you've got Diami, you've got Jahan, you've got all these playmakers, Jameson Crowder, OZ, who's ever out there who can win that matchup and we can throw a ball down the field. So I think like that's where you see kind of the layers of the offense, even though like kind of to the original point, it seems simple because of the simplicity in the formations and because of Jaden's mastery, I can get to some stuff that I feel really comfortable about. So I do think that, um, I think we're getting kind of the basic version of it, you know, in terms of Jaden being able to be like, oh, we got the numbers here. Let's get the ball out. Or I'm actually reading this guy. He ran his own read. That's a that's not an RPO, but it's a zone read, right? So there's a right. lot of that stuff, that layering happening in the offense. Um, and I and I and I'm excited because I do think it can get more complicated very quickly because the quarterback has control because of the stuff that Cliff has shown in practice. So it's kind of a fun thing because the offense is super efficient. Again, we talked about how efficient they were on second and long situations in terms of getting that chunk play to get them back in a manageable down. Um, and they're still keeping a lot close to the best. So I think it's kind of a cool opportunity. All right. So now we've, we've talked about all the good Jaden decision making, but you brought up the RPO and the, the one thing that uh, Dan Quinn was not very psyched about after the game. He joked about it. DQ is very, very good at making sure that uh, he's very positive in his public comments, which I, I think is a really great trait for a coach. Easier to do this time of year when the the uh, the pressure is a little bit lower, but he's consistently been great at that. But he did joke that Jaden's on double secret probation. The TV cameras obviously caught him during the game saying, dude, like, get down. What are you, what are we doing here on this RPO? <laughs> and Logan, I only bring it up and like kind of ask this question and think we should talk about it because this was an issue in college for him. He did yeah. take a ton of hits. You know, there's all the, the kind of reels, uh, in YouTube shorts, whatever of, uh, of him getting hit set to Looney Tunes music, which are funny because he gets up after all of them. <laughs> um, but this, this was a thing, his decision-making on how to protect himself. That said, he never had any major injuries. So there's that you know, to his credit as well. Um, but like, is this, I guess the, the most straightforward question, uh, version of this is like, is this concerning? Is this a problem that he doesn't, you know, is this his first opportunity a game to show, uh, better, better decision-making when it comes to taking hits and protecting himself. And especially in a preseason game where it's like, dude, the result doesn't matter. Extra two yards. We don't care. Please get down. And he doesn't have the field awareness to realize that there's people chasing him behind him and he, he takes a hit. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's like, so I was talking to someone about this, probably Fred or Tana, maybe London. And what they were saying is like, it takes time for people to learn a new play style, right? Because like, that's what he did. That's who he was in college. And I do think he shows really good awareness. We've talked about this in like two minute situations and when to get the ball out and all this kind of stuff. And I think as he matures, and I think this is his first run that I've seen, you know, they haven't really ran him a lot in practice. This is his first run in a game situation. It's it's exciting to touch the football like that. It's exciting when you're a playmaker like him to be able to try and uh, attack the field with with your athleticism. So what I would say is that like as he gets more aware, as he gets more comfortable, as he gets more touches on the ball, I think he'll be like, oh, this is a first down. I can slide. I don't need to like hit a home run. If the home run's there, I'm going to take it. But I think that's just comes with reps and opportunity. And again, like it's for part of me is like it's okay. You know, it's okay in that situation because he didn't take a big hit. I think that's one of the things is like, it's not like this car crash Looney Tunes thing. He like puts his head down. He tries to squeeze an extra two yards. The guy in pursuit gets him, but it's not like car crash. Like I thought Jeff Driscoll took like three or four more like significant hits when he's running the football. And it's just like, part of it is like the quarterbacks don't get touched in practice. They're getting touched for the first time. It's just like, oh, wait. Like it's like for for me as a tight end playing in the preseason, like catching the ball for the first time and running up on a guy and getting tackled for the first time, you're like, oh, I probably should have put my pads down a little bit, or I can throw a move. I don't have to run straight into him. You know what I mean? Like it, there's it, there's a learning and an acclimation period, and I think he's probably undergoing that. So I think it's good that that the staff is emphasizing that he should get down. I think that's good because you want to make sure that's a point of emphasis for him. But in terms of this, I think it's I think it's fine. I think it's one of those things that. Again, with more opportunities, more touches, he'll figure it out. I mean, clearly the correct answer, Logan, is to bring in a slip and slide like the Bears did for <laughs> Caleb Williams uh, and just have uh, have game time after practice every day. Yeah. Um, no, but I, I think I think two things can be true at once. Both, 
um, the staff should be emphasizing him getting down and they should be like, yep, hey, dude, this is this is how we like it. But I also think that sometimes we overthink this or like we actually oversimplify it maybe because I think back to last year and like I'm pretty sure the biggest hit Sam Howell took was I think it was the Denver game and he's like trying to slide out of bounds like he's trying to do both and he gets blasted because a linebacker is like, I'm willing to pick up a 15 yard penalty or I'm an idiot and I don't care. Um, like whatever the the thing that went through his head, I'm going to murder the quarterback. Like the biggest hit he took all year was when he was trying to get down. And we've seen that a ton is like guys will get down a little bit too late and they still get blasted. They, they try to run to the sideline and a, and a guy takes a cheap shot at him because then they don't protect themselves. Like I'd almost rather have him be engaged in the game being like, Oh, I could get hit here because you tend to protect yourself better. Um, and, and that's kind of the thing on that play is he's right up on the back of the blocker. Like there's no real great way to slide into the back of your teammates legs. Um, and he winds up getting brought down from behind. And so the, the realization that this isn't college and you, there are guys chasing you and they can catch you like that's important. He should be looking if he's in the open field to get down because that's where like the big hits of guy like, Hey, there's a ton of space, but he's a football player and football players get hit. And he's going to be a guy who carries the ball and ball carriers get hit. And so having, I almost, you know, considering he comes out fine, like I'm like, whatever he took a hit. He remembers that he can get tackled and get right back up. I'm not too concerned about it. Um, and that's kind of honestly where I feel about it. Maybe I'd feel different if he took a very different kind of hit, but he didn't. And sometimes that's football. Yeah. But I think, I think you brought you, I think you characterized it perfectly there. Like the staff made the correction. Like, yes, it's like, it's like he did what he did in the game everything's fine no one got hurt but i also want to make sure like hey man first down like you can slide there let's make sure we protect ourselves like that's part of the preseason that's part of the learning process just in the same way you'd kind of coach them up on a read or coach a tackle up on a pass protection like that's what you're doing you're just coaching like this is what we want and i also like was just thinking about it like dan got to see arguably one of the best quarterbacks at protecting themselves and russell wilson do it for a long time you know so he kind of has a standard of like what's good and how that should look and i think um again like I think Kyler's that, really good at it too by the yeah. way and so Cliff Cliff has a great example yeah and so I think having those guys at, at your disposal kind of be like hey like this is when you can make a play this is when we want you to be smart like that's an example I, I think a perfect example of like you definitively have the first down to slide and we we can play another day and then you go back to playing the quarterback position and being one of the more valuable players on the football team so I think it's I think it's t- perfectly normal I think it's good for him to get hit a little bit I also think it's good for them to make the correction yeah, for sure. I will say Kyler and Russ both uh, like major league or not major league, but you know, draftable caliber baseball players. So they have that that sliding experience. It's something that is very, very natural to them. That's not the case for Jaden, but hopefully he can learn it and uh, continue to protect himself over the course of a long and prosperous career. Uh, real quick uh, before we get to the defense, uh, I'm going to say we will talk about most of the rest of the guys on Thursday in terms of players that stood out uh, for good or bad reasons. But if I get Get, let you highlight one player uh, from this game that you want to talk about in 60 seconds or less. You got 60 seconds. Who's your guy? Yeah, I'll say two. One is Ben Sinnott because he's just been doing a great job. And then the other one is Luke McCaffrey. It was nice to see him catch the football a little bit up the seam. Uh, again, like I've been really impressed with how he runs routes, the suddenness. I think, again, the professionalism, how he blocks, all those types of things. And, uh, you know, like he's he was quiet for a big chunk of training camp. And then this last week, uh, before this game, in terms of the open practices, you got to see him get involved a little bit more. So, and you know, that was a point of emphasis for the staff was to get him involved. So, I think it's good to see him kind of coming along and making some plays, and uh, hopefully that continues because I think uh, he's got a he's got a good skill set and he and he catches the football in in tough spots. You know, that first catch he had yeah. in the seam was a was a nice tough catch there. So, I would love to see him actually get a chance to return a punt in the yes. third preseason game. Um, I think they would have loved that too. They gave him four opportunities, three went out of bounds. Not cool. Not cool, Miami. Mike, you're <laughs> fired. Uh, and then you also had him as a gunner and like the compete level there. I also had a note on Senate in my notes. It says, Senate is a GD load because yeah. there's like seven dudes trying to tackle him and he's just upright waddling down the field at that point. Um, that, that, that's a, that's a good rookie right there. Yeah. Um, my guy, uh, I'll even do 30 seconds. I just, Deami Brown continues yeah. to have a 
uh, a good camp, good summer, uh, and now a good game, three catches. And I think the biggest thing for me is the smoothness with which he's catching the football, because that has kind of sometimes been an issue with him where it's kind of this bumbly, like, ah, can I catch it? And it's like, ah, you're a wide receiver. We really need you to do the receiving part here. And just the smoothness of getting in, out of the route, catching the football, tucking it away, securing it. He's, I know he's been doing a ton of work on the jugs and did a lot of work this off season and it, it's showing off. So good for Diami, um, because if they can, you know, this, this is sometimes what happens with guys who are not first, second round picks. It takes them a couple of years to adapt to the NFL level. And if he all of a sudden pops as a legitimate starting caliber receiver um, or a legitimate, at least rotational level receiver that gives them a very specific set of skills that is really, really valuable to this offense with his speed. And especially in this offense where the vertical game and then the comebacks off of it are uh, an essential part of this success. Okay, Logan, to the defense now. And again, we'll do a lot more on some of the O-line play and, and deeper into the wide receiver room and all that kind of stuff. And obviously deeper than we'll get right now into the defense on the show later in the week. Make sure that you're uh, subscribed, whether you are watching or listening right now. That way you do not miss it uh, if you are not subscribed. So uh, defensively, most of like the front seven starting wise doesn't play Dorrance Armstrong, Frankie Luvu, kind of the exceptions there. Um, you have the the starting back end. Uh, but I, I thought one thing that was interesting just as a starting point here, Logan, is you know, Luvu kind of plays that that main linebacker role, uh, which I thought was interesting because if this was a real game and Bobby Wagner was for some reason unavailable, like that's what I think they would do. Um, obviously, especially without Jordan McGee available, and we're hoping to find out on Monday from Dan Quinn what McGee's status is moving forward. But uh, I thought that was interesting that one of their best players is is actually out there when they rest so many of the others, and he's in there kind of in a role where it's not expected for him to be. Uh, because I'd imagine if there's one linebacker on the field a lot, sometimes that will be Wagner more than Luvu. I guess it depends on the package. I don't I don't know. What'd you make of, of Luvu being out there and his usage? I mean, I think Luvu's the guy, you know what I mean? I think Bobby Wagner obviously is is, you know, Hall of Fame kind of guy. But I think in terms of playmaker right now in their careers, I think Luvu's probably uh, probably the guy they want on the field more, you know, because he can rush, he can line up as the Sam, he can line up as the Will, he can be on the ball, he can be off the ball. He's a great blitzer. He's super physical. I think he's just more of a more of a, a dynamic playmaker. And again, that's not any, that's not a knock on Bobby. It's just like you know, he's what is he, thirty two, thirty three, whatever he is. So like he's it's just different. And I think um, I think that's kind of the way just in terms of the way he's been used to practice, that's what I would expect to. And again, it's hard to know what their what their actual usage plan with Bobby is because he's he's taking vet days. He's, you know, practicing the joint practice. He's not doing this. Like he's got he's on a different workload, which is totally, you know, to be expected. So when they're both healthy, when they're both out there, I think it can still change. But I think as of right now, I think you probably prefer Luvu just because of the place because of his play style um but we'll see you know maybe um and, and again like for the majority of the defense the starting defensive reps so it was about 12 plays 15 plays something like that they yeah. had two linebackers on the field right the other guy was um gosh i'm gonna butcher his name number 32 Mal malik is Mike, that his name uh michael walker Michael Michael Walker, yeah, he. I yeah. think he's a heck of a player, man. He had an excellent. He played game. a lot too. He was in there the entire. That dude, that dude had to keep his pads on at halftime. He played yeah. like forty. I think it was forty nine snaps. Yeah, he played absolutely insane. But I do think like if you're looking at linebacker usage, like they had two linebackers on the field the entire time they uh, the first defense was out there. And then the nickel player was Mike Sanderstall, you know. And so I think that's probably I would expect something. Very, very similar, but instead of Michael, you get Bobby Wagner. So I think like that's kind of the usage and the guy you want on the line of scrimmage, the guy you want blitzing is probably Luvu, and the guy in the more traditional linebacker role is probably Bobby, is, is what I would say looking at that. Yeah, um, we'll talk more about the linebackers, uh, obviously on the, the uh, pod where we predict who's going to make the team, but I do think Anthony Pittman had a couple of rough plays, including the penalty, which is a vet. You're like, dude, come on. And the yeah. linebacker numbers are going to be interesting. The fact that Walker was out there first, um, I know they play slightly different positions, but like that is, that was something that definitely caught my eye and we'll talk more about it 
on Thursday. Um, as far as the starters go, obviously St. Juice gives up the touchdown and, and there's another big play down the sideline later uh, in the third corner, about four minutes left, Logan. And uh, B. Mitch talked about on the, the broadcast, like the technique there in terms of playing through the hands and, and making sure that you, you get there in time. And I, I'm just kind of curious what you've seen because you, you've talked about that on the show before too, of the, the, the way that they teach it and playing through the hands. Is this just are those good throws that you just sometimes, Hey, there's not a whole lot you can do. You get beat. Is that, Hey, they're still adjusting the technique. Or was there a mistake made earlier in the down that perhaps got them a half step behind? And that's the difference in the NFL. Like what, what do you make specifically of the St. Juice play, but it's almost a carbon copy in a different part of the field uh, on that play. I think it was woods uh, on, on the, the bad end of that in the third quarter. Yeah. I mean, I think with, uh, let's talk with St. Juice. I, the only thing I would say, cause I actually thought he was in pretty good relationship to the receiver. And I know people are going to be like, Oh, don't defend him. Oh, he's trash or whatever. But like he, like he's in good position. He played a pretty good game. You know what I'm saying? And like, I, as an offensive player, I say that's like one of the better throws I've seen on a fade in a long time. Like it's, it's not this big looping arc. It's like up and down. It's on the part. It's in the bucket. Like the receiver has late hands. Like that ball is, is in a really good spot. The only thing I would say, and this is something you'd have to talk to, um, Joe Witt Jr. about and, and the defensive backs coach is like, I feel like I would like him to get hands on the receiver earlier in the down. Because then it just disrupts it later. And I think St. Juice does a great job with the short area quickness. He does a great job on the turn. He's in good relationship. Like he's less than an arm's length away. And um, I think one way to help yourself out there would be to kind of press. Um, and they've been working on that a little bit more. But again, I don't know based on the defensive call if that's what they're exactly looking for. and Or right. if he's comfortable with that technique yet. So on that one, I say it's kind of it's a good throw, you know, like it's probably the best throw I've seen on that. Like, I think a good juxtaposition is the Driscoll to um, Tinsley throw later and uh, for our offense, right? Where mm -hmm. he's, he feels a little bit late on the throw. It's a double move. So the timing's a little bit different. Feels a little bit late. There's a little bit more air and the DB is able to rally, recover and play through the hands to break it up. Like, I think if you get a ball like that, I think St. Juice easily breaks it up and probably could even make a play on the ball. But that's not the throw you got. He got a, a throw from a guy in uh, Tua Tagovailoa who's got got paid a lot of money and showed, to my estimation, like I didn't know he had that in the bag, that kind of throw. So is definitely uh, playing some good football and, and delivered an excellent ball. So I think, again, like I don't want to sound like I'm making excuses for him, but I think that's a pretty challenging spot to be in a DB. The only thing I would question, and again, I don't have any insight on this. I'd have to talk to the defensive staff, is do you want him to be more physical early in the down? Because that would disrupt that that throw later you know what i'm saying it would disrupt the receiver disrupt the timing because two is throwing that essentially off a quick game you know like it's from the right. gun so it's, it's like a, one two out yeah it's, one, it's, two a, out. it's a timing throw and so like it's a quick game ish concept to the left so i think it is a quick game setup right and i think with that press coverage on the outside he probably had a hitch called because it was i think it was fourth and one probably had a hitch called versus press or versus him within three yards of the cushion. You're going to convert that to a fade. I think that's exactly what you got. And again, I don't think St. Juice is in a bad spot. I think that throw is just tremendous. So, yeah. And I think, I think I'd be so curious to ask Joe Witt be like, all right, good spot versus optimal spot. Like, can yes. you, can you be, yeah. cause if you get that extra half step, are you into his body? Can you drive him out of balance right. a little bit? Um, you know, can you potentially, if, if you realize what's happening, get your head around and make a play on the ball versus just trying to play through the hands. Cause you're, you're in trail. But again, like if that's, if that's the coaching point of to be in trail and to be right on that back hip, and then play through the hands, then maybe it's just a matter of execution. Um, but that that's a question for Joe Witt Jr. and and Juice and and that staff. So I just thought it was interesting because, you know, Brian talked about it on the telecast. I know we've talked about it before, the, you know, being occasionally late playing through the hands. Yeah. Um, but that is, does seem to be a case where just, hey, good job to a, you know, handshake, congratulations yeah. on, on a heck of a throw. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. What else do we got? Uh, oh, the other the other uh, big, I think, talking point defensively is obviously Jamin has the the play late in the game. Yeah. And I had start. I had made a note. Um, you know, as I'm watching, like Jamin rush plan. We got to talk about it because you know, for some of the first snaps uh, that he gets there, I feel like some of the traits started to show up. Yeah. where he is explosive off the ball. And like Jamin talked about this week, some of the, the tips and tricks that some of the, the coaches have given him to try to unlock the, the reasons why he's 
being asked to do this in the first place, that that explosive nature, being able to use his length, use his size, use his twitchiness. And yet he would just launch himself right into the middle of the offensive tackle. And you're like, ah, oh, that's, that's what they want, not what you want. And then all of a sudden, boom, he has, he has a, I think a good move on the play before the sack uh, and, and force fumble. And then all of a sudden he hits with a boom, boom, like inside move gets on, gets to the quarterback and Eureka it's there. He shows some other great, uh, you know, it's like a swipe move later in the game where he's able to get the corner. And all of a sudden, you know, here we are a month into this experiment, Logan, and and some things are starting to come together. What'd you make of Jamin's day and, and kind of where we are in the progression for him to be, you know, a defensive end in the NFL? Yeah, I'm really happy for Jamin. I mean, he just like, this is a tough thing to do. We've talked about it. We talk, I mean, I, mm-hmm. I've been very open about my reservations about him making the switch and he seems to have just handled it extremely well. And I think the fact that you see him showing up, like, uh, you know, he has a PBU on a keeper, like where the quarterback's rolling out, he reads out of it and his speed to get there. The play before, it's a keeper. He runs the guy down at the sideline. Like, he's just doing a good job, like hustling. And I think that's the thing. It's like good things come to those who run. And he's been running the football. And I think as as you become better in terms of your pursuit, in terms of your angles, which he's done a great job with, it buys you time as a rusher, you know, it buys you time. And so, you know, even on the sack force fumble, I don't, if I'm coaching him, I'm like, I don't really love your angle here. I don't really love kind of your get off, but you make it work because you're a good athlete. So I just think like, even though that's not the most polished rush I've ever seen, like, because he's a, he's athletic and he's, and he's starting to get that feel you're describing, he's able to get some production on a sack. And, you know, that's Patrick Paul. Like, that's a guy that I had a pretty high grade on uh, coming out of the draft, and uh, he played really well in the first preseason game. He played really well outside of that one snap. Um, So I think, like, that's that guy's going to be an NFL tackle at some point. He's going to be starting for Miami probably next year, you know, when uh, Armstrong retires. So, like, that's not, like, just some slouch guy who's not playing football anymore, right? So, um I, I think there's a lot of really positive things this progression. It's nice to see the production starting to come with it. And uh, I think production breeds confidence. And I think there's a significant chance, like a legitimate opportunity, like real, 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 that he's on the team and maybe midway through the season, if he keeps progressing the way he's progressing, like contributing as a pass rusher in those in those situations that Dan alluded to, the, the what is it, the two-minute and uh, third long situations. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's the question too, right? Like, I think at this point, you know, we both would change our tune on whether or not he's making this team from where right. we were, what, two, three weeks ago, where it's like, man, the numbers really, you know, all due respect to Jamin, the numbers are not good. Um, but I, I think at this point, like, he's so committed to it and they're committed to him that he's going to be on the team. And then the question becomes like on game day, is he one of the inactive guys? Um, or is he a guy that they're like, no, we trust you from week one. Even if we know you're not close to where we hope you can get to, because I think, I think they're not just hoping that he can like pass as a whatever, like they're hoping that, you know, he's he, with the, the athlete that he is, that he can be really good at this, but that's going to take time. That's going to take reps. It's going to take, and especially at a position where if he's only playing limited number, like those reps are going to be hard to come by because he's not playing snap in snap out. But at the same time, there's only so many of those dudes that you have and you want to rotate your guys on game day. So is he inactive or is he active? And if he's active, he's playing um, and not just on special teams. So that that's going to be interesting to watch. But I, I think what we've seen so far is, pretty good and yeah. that you know if he's out there playing some on game days like you're not dead in the water with Jamin Davis and I think you know the athleticism puts a floor underneath him too that you see it on that the play right before the sack uh, and I'm glad you brought that one up the change of direction and like pursuit ability he has means that and, and his willingness to do the work to run to hustle like okay it's a naked bootleg to your side you get caught a little bit inside pivot and chase a guy down and you force an incompletion if that happens in a game, like that's an excellent outcome. Yeah. And so his ability and willingness to just make himself as right as humanly possible, even if it's not pretty, even if it's not ideal, as he continues to bank these reps, um, I think gives him a floor that makes him playable. And so I'm, I'm excited to see what it is. Um, and I, I don't think that we would have said that a month ago. I think we were both uh, scared uh, for him a little bit a month ago. And it speaks really uh, well to him of how quickly he's made this transition um, to a level that feels playable in an NFL regular season game, even if it's not close to optimal yet. Yeah. And it's also kudos to the coaching staff. Cause like that's tough yeah. to do, man. It's tough to take a guy who's like playing linebacker, moving to defensive end. And then for him to 
be like, I'm going to say struggle, like struggle with the transition early on, but you trust your evaluation, trust what you see, trust your coaches, trust Ryan, trust Daryl Tapp. And this is the result. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty impressive, you know? And I, and again, like his, the change over the last three weeks specifically has been very drastic. And I just think, man, in three more weeks, if he makes the team and he's playing, like, what's it going to look like? You know, like, is he going to be able to be that guy that comes in? You know, you're like, uh, this is a very lofty comparison, but like your Bryce Huff pass rush specialist, right? That can give yeah. you some consistent pass rush juice and then also kind of spell guys on first and second down. Like, it's it's a really interesting thing all of a sudden at, at that position. And uh, I'm really excited for him, really happy for him that he was able to get that play. And you should have, like, I was standing right next to the bench when he got the sack. You know, and they just were ecstatic for him. And I just it just shows you, I think, A, how he's respected and how they appreciate the transition on the team, but also like the just change in culture and the love and support that this team has for each other is is pretty cool. So Yeah, I, I just think that this whole culture and atmosphere that, that's we'll can close with this too. I don't know if you saw Dan's presser, um, but he was asked about, you know, talking to Kaz Allen and talking to Riley Patterson after their mistakes, the fumble for Kaz, uh, which we'll talk more about Allen's uh, spot on this roster, obviously on Thursday. Riley Patterson, the kicker, has two misses. And you can see on the telecast, you know, Dan talking to him and, and being uh, you know, productive because uh, he knows at the very least he needs him for the rest of this game. And I think especially in Kaz's case, all due respect to Riley Patterson, like this is a guy that they hope to develop into a weapon for them over the long term, even if it takes a couple of years um, of him being on the practice squad. And so I, I think that the, you know, the toughness is not, you know, just yelling at dudes, w- wagging their finger or your finger in their face and, and looking tough because you're being hard on them. It's giving people the tools to succeed. And Dan talked about that in the postgame press conference of, hey, if, if we're going to ask you to do something, we're going to give you the tools to be correct. And so for Riley, it's, hey, was was I a little too close on my approach? Uh, for Kaz, it was the ball tucked, you know, in the right spot. Uh, did I have the right pressure on the ball? Like, we're going to we're going to figure out why the mistake happened and we're going to correct it. And that is by definition, according to uh, actually a book I'm reading right now called do hard things. Uh, the, the definition of toughness is understanding, like challenging people, but giving them the tools to succeed. And Dan is as exceptional as I've any coach that I've covered in understanding that and doing that. You've obviously experienced that as a player. Um, but I think it then creates this atmosphere that is good for everybody and is supportive. And there's a camaraderie and a, we're in this together. We're going to figure out you know, our problems. And I think especially in a year where they could lose a, a decent number of games because they're in year one of a rebuild. And if we're realistic, that could be on the table for them. They could do a lot better, but we'll see. Um, having that that kind of atmosphere is really, really important. And um, Dan's ability to in a spring and, and the first part of this training camp in the summer establish that is impressive uh, to me. Yeah, and I think, like you said, like, you know, he's the first guy that talks to Kaz Allen, you know, after the fumble. He's the first guy that talks to him after his first carry after the fumble, you know, just to kind of say good job. And, you know, we talked about Kaz and kind of him switching from receiver to running back-ish. You know, he got some carries at running back. And then I look at Dominic Hampton, you know, and what they're doing with him and kind of the transition he's making and the support that they've given him. And I actually thought he came out of that looking pretty good and pretty confident playing linebacker for this team. So, I, I again, it's – it's trusting your staff. It's trusting the culture that you're building. It's and it and it, like you said, it's embodying that. You know, it's embodying the the support of it. You know, like you're not always, you know, it's not always the stick. Sometimes it's the carrot. And I think it takes a special leader to understand when to do that. You know, and I think Dan has that. And I think again, he's he's empowered his staff, and he's and he's gathered a staff that also knows how to do that. So um, again, it's still early in the pre, early in the process, but I, I like. I like those elements, and it's cool to see them show up in the preseason. No doubt. All right. uh, On the Thursday show, we will do a 53-man roster projection. That's going to be really, really interesting. Numbers are tight at a couple of spots. Some really interesting players to talk about. Uh, And... We'll, uh, we'll we'll put our Adam Peters hat on and do our best uh, on, on the Thursday show. So make sure you're subscribed if you're not already uh, on YouTube. Go ahead and hit that like button. If you made it this far, you either are sadistic or you actually liked it. So it's you know, you're just being honest. Just hit the button uh, so that more people can can find this podcast and check it out. Uh, leave a comment if you like. And of course, uh, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, etc., uh, subscribe, follow, whatever it is on your platform of choice. Uh, until that Thursday show, see y'all on the radio. 
video, four to seven on the Team 980 for the Hoffman Show. And uh, Logan, of course, doing everything over with the Commanders, uh, the Command Center Show. Uh, you know, he's got podcasts, he's got he's got digital shows. Um, he's he does whatever Fred Smoot says. It's it's a good time. Uh, all right, that's it. That's all for this edition of Take Command. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching and listening. Thanks for watching this clip of Take Command, which has a brand new home. That's right. You can watch on YouTube at the Team 980. You can also listen to full episodes in the free Odyssey app, which is now enabled with Apple CarPlay. So we'll just, you know, follow you around. <laughs>